This is Continuum Drag, a weekly podcast for visiting television, sci-fi, fantasy, and everything in between. This week, Time Travelers. What's that? Is this data misprint? No, no. That's today's paper just out. Today is Saturday, October the 7th? Well, sure, mister. Seth, so, what's the matter? Computers, I should have guessed when they dumped us in the wrong place. Should have been here October 4th, remember? What difference does that make? We still have four days to find Dr. Henderson. Oh, you're wrong, Clint. In less than 29 hours, this whole city is going to be in flames. Welcome to Continuum Drag, the podcast that's too young for the moon, but too old for Mars. I'm Luke, here with my co-host Jordan. What's real, Jordan? I'll tell you, after watching this show, I guess I just fell in love with history. <laughs> Oh man. I mean, it's a real it's a real trip back in time this one, quite literally. Yeah. I guess it's written two ways, back to the 1970s and then back to the 1870s. 1870s, yeah. Well, this week we are joined by a guest. Welcome my cousin Nick. How's it going, Nick? Great. Thanks for having me. I guess technically we're having you back. You did briefly appear in a uh, deleted scene from Harsh Realm in year 1. Yeah, my finest work. <laughs> That was the finest? Absolute best. <laughs> this one's downhill from there. <laughs> um, well, Nick, before we get into it, you know, we're a sci-fi TV podcast. I think you've listened before. What's what's your history with science fiction television? Are you, you're a fan, I know. Oh, yeah. I watched a lot of uh, Star Trek Next Generation back in the day. So I was pretty much doomed from there. <laughs> I was thinking about it the other day, and I think that I might have started, like, getting into science fiction because you lent me Ender's Game one time when we were kids. Oh, boy. That was it. That opened the gateway. Well, I'd apologize here, but, you know. You don't sound that sorry. I'm not. Jordan, you ever read Ender's Game? Yeah, I have read Ender's Game. I think it's the only of the series I read, though. Yeah, that's fine. (laughs) You know what it was? I think, doesn't the next one take place like a hundred years later or something? It does. They're on another planet and they're doing like totally different stuff. I think that's what it was. I was like, a hundred years later, see you later. A <laughs> hundred years later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you just said you weren't going to be bringing your A game. <laughs> I've got other games. <laughs> Well, uh, before I get started, too, I just wanted to note, because this is a a fun piece of trivia for the listener. Is it? Mm, Probably not. (laughs) We'll find out. (laughs) This is going to be our first ever three-province recording. That's right. I'm in Ontario. Jordan's in Manitoba. Nick's in Saskatchewan. It's amazing. Technology, right? Yeah, technology. The future is now, and uh, we're all experiencing only the most marginally slight different uh, temperatures. (laughs) (laughs) All right, you guys, Let, let's let's start talking about this TV movie we're watching, Slash Failed Pilot from 1976, Time Travelers. I don't know if you guys looked into too much of the uh, creatives behind this, but there's kind of a, a couple interesting people involved in the show. Mm-hmm. There was uh, the producer of it, Erwin Allen. I don't know if you know him, you guys, but he, uh, he he's behind the, the mastermind behind the TV shows Lost in Space and another one called Time Tunnel, which I guess this is a soft reboot of. I think Time Tunnel is a better title, isn't it? It's a pretty good title. Time Travelers maybe is just too generic. Yeah. And then he also produced uh, some of my favorite movies from the from the 70s, The Poseidon, the Poseidon Adventure and The Towering Inferno. He was like mm. a real real disaster mastermind. And this movie, or this TV show, TV movie, that's what we're watching, it's a real perfect combination of both those things. Both a disaster film and a science fiction film. <laughs> they love that fire stock footage. Or I guess not stock footage, footage from another film, clearly. Um, and then uh, I guess the other person of note was uh, this was all based on a story by Rod Sterling, mm-hmm. who, of course, is famous for uh, The Twilight Zone, most famously. Do you think, though, that it was based on something he just told someone on the way to like the washroom? <laughs> I will tell you, I looked at the Wikipedia for this. And in the Wikipedia, there is a note that there was a lawsuit that actually made this a failed pilot around the show. Apparently, there was an unpublished like novel or short story by an author with a very similar premise 
similar enough that uh, he was able to like file a lawsuit with this production before it, while they were shopping it around as a TV series, which is why it was repackaged as a TV movie and just never ended up going anywhere because it was like so embroiled in this lawsuit. And in mm. the end, he well, not in the credits of the movie, going forward, he was given a story by credit along with Rod Sterling. So perhaps Rod Sterling just read a book, forgot he read it, and then wrote it down a story on a piece of paper. There's so much meat on this bones of this uh, of this movie that like it's got to have so many hands involved. Oh, uh, you really didn't like it, did you? <laughs> it's not that I didn't like it. I'm confused at what this is. <laughs> All right, well... We'll get into it, but first, Jordan, since it was broadcast on March 19th, 1976 on ABC, wouldn't you like to know what was happening in the world around then? Well, I'll tell you one thing. Was this airing at the same time as Spectre? It was not. Mm. Sorry. I think they had a few years between them. Oh, okay. But uh, what was happening is the day after it aired, two events happened, Jordan. And Nick, you're here. I keep forgetting. (laughs) I'm here. I'm still here. Uh, First... On March 20th, Patty Hearst was found guilty of robbery. Yeah, classic. Classic 1970s. And uh, that same day, lead vocalist of Linkin Park, Chester Bennington born. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know why that's so funny. Your favorite band, Linkin Park. That's my favorite band. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like that song they do. um, uh, Show me the money. I don't know what they they sing. Oh, the one where they sing. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) All right, you guys, let's get into it. Here is the IMDb summary for time travelers. Two researchers travel back in time, trying to cure a modern day epidemic, but their plans go astray when their time travel brings them to Chicago, not a week, but a single day before the great Chicago fire. And that was courtesy of Antius Feldspar. Can I just say one thing to start? The file we had sounds like there's someone taking a shower just off screen at all times. You get used to it, but it was hard to hear. It is definitely not one of the more high quality YouTube videos I've seen in my life. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it all begins in New Orleans. It's Mardi Gras. People are having a great time. There's a very good piece of uh, score, very, very, like, what would you call it? Synthy sci fi score playing mm-hmm. over a Mardi Gras parade. Some excellent sci fi music. Yeah. We cut to an ambulance slash a van. I've never seen an ambulance van before, but I loved it. And it's bringing a girl from a marching band to a hospital because she's caught XB. XB. Does he later on call it? What did I write down? He called it something else, too. Woods fever. Something like that. Maybe that's what it was. But that was what it was originally called. But did he have another acronym for it? Or is it always just XB? It was hard to hear. It took a while before, like XD versus XB. Hmm. I also couldn't decide whether it was XD or XB, so I just went with XB. I think at some point, though, they do note that, yeah, it was previously called Woods Fever, but it's also been called things like Colin Ayla, Scaribus Toxicana. Like, they've got, like, a whole bunch of names they throw around for what this thing is. You'd think one of them would be, like, what XB stands for, but I guess not. (laughs) I mean, what does COVID stand for? Good point. (laughs) Um, But it like COVID, is a uh, burgeoning epidemic threatening to become a pandemic. It's highly contagious. It has a 40% mortality rate. And uh, a pathologist from the University of New Orleans, I guess, Dr. Clint Earnshaw, has been studying it, trying to find a cure. Only 40%, hey? It's, uh, it seems like a pretty high, uh, pretty high rating for uh, this disease, especially considering the uh, what is it? The uh, health, the public health director for Louisiana is like, he's there at the hospital with this guy, being like, "Listen, I'm not shutting this city down. We're in the middle of Mardi Gras," and they're like, 40 percent of the people who get this die, and a lot of people have it already." <laughs> yeah, that did seem surprising, didn't it? That they were like, 40 percent is a high percentage for people dying from a virus." Yeah, and they were just like, "You know what? People got to float." <laughs> It's like, look, man, they're really into this Mardi Gras. And so what if half our city's going to die in a few weeks? I thought he was a real, like, Jaws-style mayor. <laughs> yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he just comes and he's like, guys, checks are going to they're gonna get cash. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but yes, as, as we mentioned, this, this disease has been seen before. It seems to be similar to something that's thought to be extinct, something called Woods Fever. But uh, unfortunately, the man who they thought had cured Woods Fever back in the 1870s, all his research was lost in the Chicago fire at the time. That's unfortunate because it's the same thing. And if they could just have his research, they'd be able to solve this disease or virus or whatever it is. And yeah, they never are too specific, huh? <laughs> I think they do say disease and virus. All we know is it's bad. 
But Washington has sent help for Earnshaw in the form of a sleepy former astronaut, Jeff Adams. <laughs> I don't think he says he's a former astronaut for a while, does he? I think somewhere ne- somewhere in his introductory period here, they talk kind of about how he dropped out of NASA. Okay. Just because I believe in that is my line from the beginning. He says, I didn't want to be an astronaut anymore because I was too young for the moon, too old for Mars. Yeah, he, he said that. But I think a little bit later, because right now, when they first introduce him, they have uh, the doctor just giving this biggest eye roll when he says... Uh, it's like, oh, I took some, like, phys ed classes or something. Yeah. Well, I think when they meet him, like, the doctor goes to meet him at his office, and uh, old Adams is literally, like, sleeping on his couch, and he's he's got a crocodile Dundee hat on his head, covering his face, dressed in a completely blue jumpsuit and jean jacket jacket. <laughs> Why is he so tired? Is it simply because he's just so nonchalant about everything? Just planes make him sleepy. <laughs> planes make him sleepy. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Well, I think, because what happens very quickly here is uh, Adams basically tells Dr. Earnshaw if he wants to cure XB, he's going to have to come with him on his White House jet. And (laughs) we cut to the jet, and as soon as it takes off, it cuts to uh, Dr. Earnshaw trying to ask him what's going on, and Adams is once again just sleeping in his chair. (laughs) It was a funny scene to add, because obviously you want to show that they're traveling, but... You could cut this out and nothing changes because there's a scene of like, where are we going? What are we doing? Who are you? Uh, What's happening? And there's just like, we'll deal with that later. All right, cut to where we arrive. It's like, well, that was, I'm glad we had that scene. It's really important to show how uh, Adams has learned an instant sleep technique from NASA and is constantly (laughs) having a nap. Like every time, every time you see him in this opening, he's asleep for some reason. (laughs) Yeah, that'll be very important later. (laughs) So we know about his character. He's tuckered out. Um, but we do get some explanations here as they sort of like travel toward their destination. Um, Adams works for a government organization doing time research. He, uh, ha- he works with two colleagues, his boss, Dr. Amos Cummings, a uh, Nobel Prize winner and former director of NASA, and uh, a female scientist named Dr. Helen Sanders, whose job appears to be packing bags for them and flipping switches on a giant computer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In the classic 1970s casting, we have a woman as a doctor, which we see all the time, but they don't want to have her do too much and be part of the action at all. So she is essentially assistant. Yeah, it's so funny because both these characters just disappear for the rest of the show. I thought maybe they'd be, ch- I thought they'd be like command center. They're always checking mm-hmm. in with them to find out what's going on. It's never clear what her job is. And then we never see either of them. It was crazy. <laughs> it is odd to introduce these characters. I mean, obviously, if the idea was that if this was going to be a series, you'd learn more about them and maybe they'd be involved more. But it's, it is odd for a standalone to just introduce characters that the viewer's supposed to remember as they bookend them. What we do come to learn about their uh, time research project is they're able to send people back in time. And basically, Adams and uh, Dr. Earnshaw will be the fifth people to go back in time. Um, and so far, only one other person has died doing this. It's pretty yeah. safe. Yeah, one out of five, that's not so bad. I like those odds. It's way lower than 40%. It's, that's true. It's much better than getting XB. <laughs> do we all remember how that guy died, though? Absolutely. So they, they were setting it up to be like um, our, our astronaut pals being all cagey about what happened to this last guy. Uh, it turns out he just got shot with an arrow. It is funny because you, th- oh, I was, and I don't know how you guys felt, I was assuming that what they would have said is something in the actual process of time traveling, like, you know, he time traveled and only his legs showed up or something. I thought it was going to be something like that. It was, uh, you know, like the old transporter accident. But it's no, it's like, no, they went to a dangerous area they weren't prepared for and uh, they died from it. The uh, the full explanation was like, I was baffled by it because I, I believe what they said was he came back 20 minutes late with an arrowhead in his back, completely decomposed. I was like, excuse excuse me? <laughs> completely decomposed? I think they were playing with the idea that it affected how he traveled through time. So now he had become decomposed over the time period he died. It didn't really make any sense, but it was it was really to make you uh, understand that the stakes have never been higher. <laughs> well, I believe they even say they're like, they're like, well, we don't know why that happened. So <laughs> <laughs> it's like shrug. Anyway, you guys are number five. Yeah. But yeah, basically, uh, Dr. Earnshaw and Adams get dressed up in old 1970s costumes, and uh, they're going to head back to find Dr. Henderson, the man who cured XB in 1871 in Chicago. And to do it, they're going to use the time stairs. <laughs> well, there's, there's a couple of things here. One, the, um, the room 
command central or whatever you want to call it where all the computers are is the exact 1970s computer room we've seen in every single tv show from the 1970s it's the same computer room yeah just giant lots of blinking lights lots of switches to flip (laughs) yeah and then the second thing is both of you explain it to me how did the time travel process work other than standing on stairs computers did it i mean first of all someone describe these stairs nick describe these stairs to the listener (laughs) So they're just like your everyday stairs kind of made out of pipe so that it doesn't hide any of the cool science mist they have going on in the background. Science mist. It's a better title for this. <laughs> they're standing on these stairs. There's mist everywhere. They have cl- they close the door because I guess you're in some sort of void. And they do a reverse shot of what you see when you're standing on the stairs. And it's just like you're above the clouds on an airplane? Yeah. Yeah, it's a real nice patio they've got. <laughs> But it is funny that um, this show really wants to speed through to get to the 1870s because that's where the meat is. But it just it leaves you sort of baffled as to what is happening. They don't even have one line of dialogue to be like, oh, you're looking into a different dimension or you're looking into the strands of time or whatever it is. It's just like, yeah, there's a staircase and there's clouds. Anyways, 1870s. The time stairs are in the sky. I mean, I liked the concept of this weird cloudy time stairs but you're right i was i was like i i need some more information or something about what's happening here even again just a throwaway line of like oh you know it's uh uh whatever i I don't know i'm not the writer of this thing come up with something rod sterling get on it yeah maybe they were just saving all the details for i don't know other episodes if robin filled in an episode too (laughs) yeah (laughs) Um, but essentially they descend this staircase and it pops them out on a staircase in a train station in old timey Chicago. Oh, and can I mention one thing? They make a point just before they either right when before they travel or right when they travel that the thing you always see in all the all time travel movies or TV shows is they have to make the point. You can't change history. Absolutely. And you have to return on the same staircase. (laughs) But I'm going to argue they make zero efforts to not change history. I mean, we can talk about the logic of this thing as we go through. I had, I had many questions about the time travel. Yeah. <laughs> what I did like, though, is because they step down the staircase, we get a lot of wide shots of this, like, really good old Chicago set piece. Like, it's huge. They're shooting wide vistas. It's, like, full streets of, like, 1970s. And it, part of it is because this whole set was built for Barbara Streisand's Hello, Dolly. It was actually New York in the 1870s. But I will say, like, a great great job i mean maybe they wrote the whole thing around the fact they had access to the set but like there is got to be 50 to 100 extras in these scenes everyone in period costumes like it actually is like really for these shows we've watched i'm like this looks great i agree with you that it does look great but i think you made an interesting point that i think they had the access to the set so they wrote a story about it and then realized halfway through they didn't really want to have anything set in the 1870s it feels to me like the writers halfway through are like, I'm kind of bored with this. Oh, really? Uh, well, yeah. That's interesting. I, 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 I thought it was not a bad... Uh, I thought it was interesting what they were doing with the 19, 1870s. Hmm. Not as much fish out of water stuff as I would have liked, but I didn't hate it. Hmm. Um, but unfortunately, the time stairs dropped them off a little off target, both geographically and chronologically. <laughs> I didn't understand the geographic part because like, they leave from time stairs, they arrive on some other stairs. Seemed like that part worked out pretty good. There's a weird thing they say that is, I don't know why, it was apropos to nothing, it didn't affect the plot or ever get come back to, but they like indicated they were supposed to arrive on a staircase just outside of town, why there was a staircase just outside of town, but I guess so it wouldn't be too public. But like nobody notices they appear in the middle of a busy staircase, so it, like, it was all, I'm just like, why are you guys so worried about which staircase you appear on? Didn't it feel like there was a great bit of comedy they could have had here where they thought they were going to be on stairs and they like fell into garbage or something? That would have been a good twist, too, where you're like, how do we get back up to the st- to the stairs entry point? There's like a final like race to get back to in time. It was a missed opportunity. You're right. But anyways, stairs in the 1970s, stairs in the 1870s. That's all you got to know. And a newspaper they find quickly lets them know the date. They've arrived not a week before the Great Chicago Fire, but only 29 hours. They wanted to get there a week before. But why not do two weeks? Why not do four weeks? Like, it's th- th- there was never any indication that it was the day before the Chicago fire that he finally had his cure. They could have probably come, like, six months before. Yeah, they didn't have to push it so close. To begin with, yeah. Maybe they were thinking there was going to be some kind of breakthrough that he had, like, the day before the Chicago fire. But probably not. 
I was also thinking, I'm like, just climb back up the stairs and try again. You're time traveling. <laughs> like, there's no reason you need to stay. I didn't even think of that. That's funny. They're right. There was nothing stopping them. They probably didn't even know if they could do that yet. Yeah, I mean, I, just, I, wasn't, I think part of it, too, is like it wasn't clear if there was like a window they had to hit. Because even at the end, it doesn't seem like they're racing back to hit a window to get back to their time. They're just trying to get away from the fire. So I was just like, I don't understand what's stopping you from trying again. Yeah. Anyway, I also enjoyed uh, that newspaper they find at the date on. The headline uh, on it was uh, Stanley in Africa looking for Livingston. Big story at the time. It, it was. I'm like, now I'm really placed. That's like my openings of these podcasts when I go back in time and look at where we are. <laughs> at any rate, uh, Dr. Earnshaw and Adams, they head to Dr. Henderson's hospital to meet him where they discover him. And they also meet his uh, nurse daughter or not daughter. Pardon me. His niece, niece Jane. Um, do you want to describe old Dr. Henderson and his uh, niece, Jane? So Dr. Henderson seems like a kind of old beard guy, uh, devil may care kind of doctor. He's treating his patients with uh, wine and quinine, quinine, quinine. Oh, yeah, I really like that. They, uh, he's giving them quinine pills that he says are just the placebo to keep them calm. <laughs> I like Henderson. He's my favorite character of this, uh, of this show, like a Hemingway-esque sort of figure. I like him. He's rough around the edges. He's always chomping that cigar. Mm-hmm. I also was just like, what a cigar chomping badass this guy is. Um, I made I made a quick note because I, I did a quick look when I was hearing about him saying he's like, yeah, I'm just using a quinine pill to like as a placebo to keep them calm while they rest. I was like, why does that sound so familiar? It's because quinine is a precursor to that anti-malaria drug Trump's been pushing during COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> this is so topical, this movie. It is. I was like, ah, oh, good. Good to know. Pandemics never change. <laughs> I think this show really made a mistake because I think Henderson is the most interesting character in this. And I think the two leads are pretty lame. They're pretty generic. Henderson is like the most interesting character here. Yeah, it's a missed opportunity. Like at the very least, Henderson just should be, like come back with them and become their boss in the future. Or something. I was sure that was going to happen. I was sure they were going to have an old timey doctor be part of their team. All right. We've talked about Dr. Henderson a little bit. What about his, what about his niece, Jane? So she's obviously the love interest, right? At first sight, our time-traveling doctor here sees her, and he's like, you know what? Maybe I should get to know this nurse. <laughs> he's like, va va voom 1870s, what have I been missing? <laughs> I like that at some point, because she's like, oh, you're a doctor, eh? Well, what do you do in your free time? Uh, shoe horses? Go fishing? And he's just like, whoa, I should move back to the 1870s. Those both sound great to me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, at any rate, that sort of like introduces all the characters we're going to have in the show. They kind of tell Dr. Henderson that they that the Surgeon General has sent them from Washington to help with this outbreak to find out kind of, you know, how he's curing these patients of Woods fever. But as we've kind of said, he mostly just gives them wine and a placebo and he has no idea what's curing them. He's just like, I don't know, maybe bed rest. <laughs> But I should mention, there's a scene that goes on longer than you think, where we watch Dr. Henderson choke a pill into a guy. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, he's a real renegade doctor. When that guy won't take his pill, he literally chokes him out until he swallows that pill. <laughs> and it, I'm just going to say this. The ends justify the means, am I right? <laughs> he's the, he is the character to watch, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. But now that they kind of know that there is no cure still for XP, that... Uh, we, they kind of do a little bit of a research montage. Um, we basically see D Dr. Earnshaw and Jane. They're going through uh, Henderson's notes. They're running experiments based on what they're seeing. They're trying to figure out what he's doing that could possibly be curing XB in the past. And I don't know if you noticed during this strange montage, because mostly it's those two flirting and doing research. And I was just like, where's Adams in all of this? Did he just leave to take another nap? Like, he just disappears for long periods of time. And since my only character understanding of him is sleeping, I, I only assume if he's not on screen, he's sleeping somewhere in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. I mean, it is funny. I always think it's interesting when you see these TV shows and they add a whole bunch of characters and then it seems right away they don't know what to do with the characters. You know, it's like, well, we have to have a love interest. Well, we have to have that woman. Then we have to have this doctor. Well, we got to add another doctor. It's like, maybe you guys just don't have so many characters if you have to have people sleeping all the time. Yeah. Well, they had, like, in their time traveler cast, they had, you have your science guy doctor, and you have your action guy astronaut. And when there's no action going on, I guess it's nap time for your astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Call me when there's some action. I got a nap to take. <laughs> That's his autobiography title. Call me when there's some action. But thankfully for him, there is some action after the montage because uh, Dr. Earnshaw is no closer to a cure. But uh, one of the patients who has recently been cured of XB just left the hospital. 
So he sends Adams to uh, track him down in, quote, the patch, an unsavory part of Chicago, to uh, try to get a blood sample from the patient to figure out why he recovered. And this patient, his name? Great. Sharky. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like an old sailor. I loved his face. It was like a, a relief of like a globe or something. Uh, can anyone, maybe Nick, can you describe the scene of uh, him trying to talk Sharky into giving him blood? <laughs> So Sharky's like, he's not at his best. He's drunk or something. And our astronaut shows up and is like, you know, you, you kind of get the feel that he was supposed to be able to talk his way into or out of situations. So eventually he's just like, Sharky, come on. I, I got a bunch of money. Why don't you just <laughs> stop stop walking away and we'll just uh, listen to what I'm proposing here. Yeah, cash your blood. To... It's a good deal. Yeah. Well... When he brought out the blood part, Sharky was not into that. So our, our astronaut gets uh, punched in the gut and has to start chasing uh, Sharky here. <laughs> How exciting was that chase scene, guys? Am I right? It was probably the most exciting thing in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's like watching two people slowly jog after each other. I like that it was all like it was all shot through grating or fencing from a very high angle. Even on the cuts they would like find another high angle through some more grating. The grating makes it more exciting. <laughs> yeah. You feel like you're living in the 1870s. Yeah, because all those grates went away after the 1930s. Well, no, after the Chicago fire they all burned away. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but at the end of this chase between, there's like, you know, a chase to get Sharky so he'll give him this blood. And essentially Adams, the astronaut, just like knocks Sharky into like a bunch of crates, giving him a head injury and killing him. Well, I don't know if he killed him. No, because Sharky's knocked out against these boxes. He like, well, this man's knocked out. He starts stealing the man's blood. And, you know, uh, of course, a cop runs across him being like, can I help you? Like, yeah. over this unconscious man taking his blood out of his arm. And uh, Adams runs off and, like, hides from the cops. And as they're chasing him, you hear one of the cops yell, Oh, this man's dead. He killed this man. <laughs> oh, did he? I, I didn't hear him say that. Yeah, they say, this man is dead. So Adams theoretically gave him a head injury and killed him. It would be better if they were like, this man's dead, but from unrelated causes. And it's very funny here is he goes and hides in this warehouse, Adams, and... Once again, leaves the plot for many hours, and I think has another nap in that warehouse, because we'll cut back to him hours later, still in the same position. But in terms of the actual story we're watching, why would he just sit down and take a nap? Because that's what they, they show, because when we come back to him, he's been sleeping. But what was the point of that? Well, he's kind of laying low to hide from the police, but I don't know why that means he needs to, like, take a, a solid eight hours in this garage <laughs> that's what i mean it's like i get 15 minutes maybe a half hour hiding but at that point you're good to go i mean he it, they imply he's been there for like hours and hours and hours well that's that nasa astronaut uh nap training at work <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's true because we cut back to the hospital and uh since dr earnshaw was working all night he also had laid down to have a quick nap but no one no one woke him like he wanted. So he's been sleeping so long that night has fallen over Chicago. And obviously this means the fire's approaching. Adams still isn't back. So he's been napping in that warehouse for hours. And uh, on top of all of that, Earnshaw's come down with XB fever. Don't you love, though, how they undercut the stakes they've set up that they've arrived. They were supposed to be, whatever, four days ahead. But now they're only one day ahead. So you go, oh no, there's going to be this nonstop rush to get the cure before they have to go. But then they just have the characters sleeping all the time. <laughs> like both of them. They realize writing, they're like, oh, we cut it too far from the fire. They should have been here 12 hours early to really wrap up the pace. Yeah. Could we just change it to 12 hours? Now, you know what? There's an easy solution. Let's just have the characters be real tired. <laughs> And so now that we're at the part where the Chicago fire is about to start, we cut away to a dramatic reenactment of Mrs. O'Leary's cow starting the Chicago fire. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest. I feel like a big part of why this was made is so they could shoot this scene where they reenact this like moment from history. I did check. It did start in a barn. I like none of our characters are involved and they clearly didn't have a budget to either a have a cow or like directly show the fire starting. So you see it from the perspective of a man with a peg leg who I had to look up and is a real person from that period of time who was a neighbor of Mrs. O'Leary named Daniel, quote, peg leg, end quote, Sullivan. <laughs> see how much research they put into this movie? 
It's amazing. That's what's funny. We got to make sure in this time traveling show we have all the details just right. And they seem to have an actor who legitimately has a peg leg. And what we see is him on a street corner. He hears the sound of a cow moo, looks over, sees a barn sort of across the street. Fire flares up and he screams, Mrs. O'Leary, your cow started a fire. (laughs) It's clear what happened. And the city starts to burn, which is kind of one of the best parts of this show because we basically enter the disaster movie phase of it. And like, there's lots of shots of like fire trucks driving around, footage from other movies of like buildings exploding and burning. All the extras are like in like bucket gangs throwing water on fire. Like it's it's a pretty like wide scale disaster done at a low budget, but I didn't think done badly. And this was all footage from something else, right? Here's what's kind of interesting is I do think they stole a few pieces from other movies, but in those wide shots, any wide shot where you see like fire in the distance and people running in front of it, it's actual footage from the Chicago fire of 1870. Oh, really? They've color timed it to be like orange. So it has that burning flare uh, effect, but they were actually using period specific wide shot footage of the fire to build Hmm. the actual fire, which I was like a cool idea. Hmm. That is a good idea. It feels a little creepy, though. I mean, we are already watching a degraded version of it. So we're watching a 1870s early motion picture photography of the fire that was probably not great quality to begin with through like several layers of degradation over to YouTube. So the whole thing has a very eerie effect. Yeah, it suddenly becomes like a Dario Argento movie or something. (laughs) It's pretty good. I, I, I Listen, I'd watch the Dario Argento version of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think everyone would. Anyways, as all this commotion's happening, that kind of uh, wakes Adams up from his nap, and he returns back to the hospital to find that Earnshaw's sick. And uh, he's like, you got to get up. I finally got that sharky guy's blood. We should look at it in a microscope. And uh, Earnshaw, Earnshaw pulls up the blood, and he's just like, oh, bad news about that blood you got from that guy. Turns out he wasn't actually cured, and he died from the xb and not the head injury you gave him so there's nothing to be learned for like it's the weirdest thing where like all that effort was for nothing because a he wasn't cured so his blood is useless and b there's some sort of weird backhanded way of forgiving adams for knocking him unconscious and killing him yeah it's hey don't worry adams you're not a murderer and also you didn't accidentally change the past so everything's cool (laughs) <laughs> but also, I don't think he was too worried about it. I mean, if he had murdered the guy, the first thing he did was take a nap. That's true. Everyone knew that drunk shark. He never added anything to history. He was useless. <laughs> <laughs> now, old peg leg. Peg leg, we all know. I really, I would like the idea that if, if this show went forward, like, they, I, there was an understanding in their rules that there was, like, a certain level of human being who has no effect on history, and you can just kill them at will. <laughs> <laughs> If this guy didn't change history, fair game. Yeah. <laughs> um, at any rate, Adams now is, is like, you're sick. Chicago's on fire. We got to get out of 1971. He breaks into Henderson's office. He's going to steal all his research. And they're just going to like huff it back to 1970 with that research. But unfortunately, he's caught by Dr. Henderson stealing the research and also stopped by a man with a telegram from the Surgeon General exposing the fact that he's never heard of these two men before. <laughs> I looked it up. Apparently, the Surgeon General wasn't created till the 1890s. <laughs> so for all their research, was that strike one? They missed that. I also like that this telegram operator is just like, the city's on fire, but I got to deliver this message. <laughs> you know what? He's doing his job. He doesn't care. The, this operator is probably just having the busiest night of his life, sending out telegrams like, the city is on fire. Stop. Please send help. Stop. <laughs> Do you smell smoke? Stop. Is it getting hot in here? Stop. um but essentially adams now tries to convince henderson that he's actually from the future and they can predict events that will happen during the fire like a building that's going to explode or that henderson's going to die tonight (laughs) yeah how did he know so much is he just is that his expertise is the chicago fire i felt a little bit to me like and i think this might come up in future episodes of the show is i did feel like they had done a bit of research before going back like he knew like events that were coming perhaps Earnshaw didn't because Earnshaw only showed up 20 minutes before time travel, but perhaps Adams was better like execu- or like, informed. Hmm. Yeah, and they, they didn't tell their doctor anything until like he got to the time travel office. But I feel like the uh, Adams has been doing some research into this before they went. That was funny, eh? You have time travel. You could spend a little bit of time upgrading your scientists, but they literally wanted Dr. Earnshaw to like 
Like, they didn't tell him until, like, two minutes before time travel what he was about to do. <laughs> they wanted him fresh. They wanted him uh, just full of excitement, ready to go. They didn't want to bog him down with information of what building burned when. Um, Dr. Henderson, though, is uh, not impressed by the foretelling of his own death and does not believe Adams. But he's very quickly convinced when uh, he walks in on Dr. Earnshaw using a microscope and a centrifuge from 1970. And he's discovering that the cure all along has been the wine Henderson's been feeding his patients because it has a penicillin-like antibacterial in it. Mm-hmm. It was the wine the whole time. Yeah, surprise. It was his <laughs> homebrew all along. <laughs> Often a homebrew is what saves everyone's life. <laughs> Nick, I believe you have a homebrew in your garage that's going to cure COVID, right? Well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> You're just keeping it for yourself. I need to be absolutely sure it works first. You're waiting for someone from uh, 2170 to come back in time and ask you for it. All right, let's be absolutely clear. I do not have a cure for COVID in my garage. Nobody <laughs> break in. <laughs> uh, there's just like people like trying to dissect this podcast to figure out where in Saskatchewan you are. All right. <laughs> Nick's now very worried. He's very he's just like getting extra. I just need to check door. out the window real quick. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, when Doctor Henderson sees all this future technology, he's kind of convinced that they're from the future and like that his wine may be some sort of cure. Um, and they also, it doesn't really help. Like he seems convinced by the future technology. Like that seems to convince him. But there's this extra little bit they do because they've been seeding it for the whole thing that they took a watch Dr. Henderson used to own from a museum in Chicago and brought it back in time with him with them because it has an inscription his wife wrote on it and they're going to use that to convince him they're from it, they're, they spent so much time seeing this watch but as I was making my notes I'm like this watch doesn't matter at all I guess the thing is like he's a little bit convinced he's a little convinced and then they like throw down the hammer and he's like well no one would know about that pocket watch but I just was like uh, uh, why are we wasting time here well, it's like they have this one, like, absolute proof that they're time travelers, and they just wait until, like, the end of the movie to show it to Dr. Henderson. Yeah, what was the um, point of not just coming out right from the beginning and trying to convince him if they had this quite literally in their back pocket? Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, you know, why not just start from the beginning? Because the thing is, they're not going to change time. They know he's going to die anyways. So why not just start with that and have him work with them? I mean... I think you just said it, man. It's that can't change time law, I guess, even though you brought it with you to use it as a backup. I don't know. I don't know, yeah. Jordan. Why don't you have all the answers, Luke? Because then the movie's over in 30 minutes. <laughs> um, at any rate, now that he's convinced, they're like, great, we need more wine. The sample I just tested apparently doesn't have enough of the antibacterial for us to bring back to the future. Unfortunately, his wines are across town and there's a fire. His wine stores are across town and there's a fire going on. But... He did just give a full bottle of the wine, I guess his last one in the hospital, to a Texan patient he just cured. <laughs> so it's it's action time, which means Adams gets to run across town through the burning city to get this bottle of wine from this Texan who we have this like inexplicable scene where he's releasing his head of cattle so they don't burn. And we just get all these weird shots of a stampede running through a burning city. Mm hmm. Yeah, in case you thought running through a burning city was going to be a problem for Adams or something, um, don't worry about all that. Totally fine. Nothing happens. And, sure, and he, gets to the, he gets to the cowboy who's drinking, who's drank what appears to be most of the bottle of that wine. But he's just like, yes, I got the bottle of wine. I'm like, okay. It is weird. All of the stakes they set up are set up a few minutes before, and then they just, there's no real conflict to get there. Like like Nick was saying, it's like, oh no, there's people running down the streets, and there's cattle released, and there's windows breaking, and it's like, yeah, I just need to get over there five feet. Oh, everything's good. And the guy's like, there's not enough wine. No, there is. Okay, great. And as he kind of gets back to Earnshaw, sickled Earnshaw at the hospital, the, the fires reach there. They're evacuating the hospital. He's like grabbing Earnshaw. He's like, I got the wine. We can go. And Earnshaw starts talking about it. He's like, I really feel bad for Jane. Her uncle's about to die. Her parents are dead. Her brothers are all dead. Like, I feel real bad for her. And I believe I believe uh, Adam's actual line as he's saying this is just like, uh, so what? Like, he's just like, what are, what are we talking about here? Um, but essentially, he's like, listen, Adams, you head back to the future. 
I'm going to stay in the past with Jane. I love the idea of like learning to shoe a horse or learning to fish and just like living with this woman in 1870s. I think it's going to be a better life as a doctor here for me. Would you want this guy in your team? My worry would be every single time we go back into the past, he's going to fall in love with someone and want to stay there. He's like, I love the 1920s. I like the 1540s. I like the 1310s. It's like, we get it. You love it. Well, one of these times he's just going to stay there and then that problem kind of solves itself, right? Yeah, I think it's more that just I don't want to hear him whining about it. <laughs> I, legitimately, at this point in the movie, I thought he was actually going to stay. So I did, too. I was yeah. more surprised when he was forced to return to the future against his will. But this whole scene does lead to what I would call the best line of the entire movie. And perhaps the only reason this movie should exist was for this line. He's saying how much he wants to stay and live with uh, Jane in the past. And Adams says to him, quote, she's a ghost out of the past. And you're nothing but a specter out of the future. Mmm, that is good. Excellent title. Oh man, that should have been the show's name, Specter Out of the Future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ah, oh, what a missed opportunity. As at this point, though, somebody notices that during the evacuation, they left a small girl in the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> well, she was tiny. And Dr. Henderson runs into the burning building. Jane runs after him, both heading in to save that girl. Adam's just like, I got to go with him. I got to save that little girl and I got to make sure everything's okay. And it's at this point that uh, Adams is like, uh -uh, no way. They can all die in there for all I care. He grabs <laughs> Earnshaw and basically drags him back to the time stairs. Yeah, he's got an appointment, a time appointment. Well, the reason why it's so easy to drag him is because they, uh, Dr. Henderson and Jane, they run into the hospital, which like immediately explodes in fire and then collapses. So... It's not really hard to drag uh, our, our present-day doctor back to the, the magic sign stairs. It's true. He's very sick and weak, too. He's, he's like a little kitten. You can do whatever yeah, he you does, want. Yeah, he does get to do a lot of um, sick acting in this. It's a lot of him like, oh, I'm so tired. Um, but essentially, that's it. We get, a, we get a race through the burning city of Chicago again, but they get back to the future stairs. No problems. They climb back up it, and we, we cut forward back to 1970s. Uh, it's at a hospital. Earnshaw's recovered from XB. The president has sent his thanks for curing the, for curing the disease. Dr. Cummings of the uh, Time Research Lab is offering him a job, asking, hey, you want to go back in time and check out the Black Plague next? I had one quick note, though, about uh, he got the letter from the White House and stuff, and I thought, man, he should have patented it, that cure. He could have made billions. That'd be great. This was the birth of the uh, pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> That's the whole point of the show is he just wants to go back into the past to be able to patent things so he could just keep adding to his wealth. Yeah, in a twist, they don't have penicillin yet. Actually, it's in episode two. They're going to go back and discover that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as he's in the hospital, they're like, oh, I just got a call from Adams, you guys. Let's head to Chicago real quick. He's found something. We cut again to a graveyard in Chicago, <laughs> and they're standing over Dr. Henderson's grave, like confirming that he died that night in the hospital. And then they're like, check it out a few feet away. Here's also Jane's grave. And Dr. Earnshaw is basically like, well, good thing I didn't stay. Eh? She just died right away. <laughs> to be fair, and I know this is mean, but if he had stayed and she just died right away, I mean, it is a bad reason to stay. I was just blown away because there's something just insanely dark about what an upbeat ending that is because they're basically a confirming dr henderson died they knew that now discovering oh yeah jane also died in that fire and uh third that little girl died in that fire too like that's it's a very dark no, but they cut to like very happy credits music but, for, but first you get like this weird shot of like his hand like caressing her gravestone i was yeah. really hoping he would just like jam his fingers in and start pulling up and like pull out the dead body but he it, that didn't happen <laughs> that too too dark i thought for sure there was going to be some throwaway line about they both died saving that little girl at least but they don't even give you that they're just like yeah yeah everyone died in that fire it was they're terrible like, oh, her skin was so charred it was terrible <laughs> anyway that that's kind of a wrap-up of the movie we I, I kind of like the final shot of it is they they show old, a photo of old-timey chicago and then like faded into modern day 1970 chicago they're really like really trying to upsell the history portion of the show but um that that was pretty much the wrap-up of it I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you guys have any final notes on this uh, on this time travel pandemic disaster film? I gotta say, out of like all the sci-fi I've seen with time traveling in it, this has been like the most responsibly used and safe time travel. Like, even though they got like kind of warped right before a disaster, that was pretty much on them. And like, no one got teleported back to the future with like I don't know 
melting or something. I mean, it did feel like they actually did follow all their rules at the end. Like, it was actually felt to me, I was just like, oh yeah, I guess they let everybody die who was supposed to die. They didn't change the future. By the end, they really didn't even care about these characters they spent all this time with. They were happy to let them die. They were a very responsible time travel. I was kind of surprised at how little adventure I felt watching it. I thought it was going to be... Maybe it was just the pacing of no, pacing of it, but obviously you can forgive some things. You know, it shot a long time ago and things don't always age the same. But I was just kind of surprised at how I thought this would be a lot more fun than it was. Am I the only one who felt that way? No, it was real boring. <laughs> <laughs> it just it's like it's like, oh, you're time traveling back and you gotta dress up and there's gonna be a fish out of water and stuff, and it just feel like they maybe purposely didn't hit any of those beats, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but I feel like what they replaced it with, I don't know if there was, it was fully realized. It was a medical drama. Yeah, exactly. And it was just like, oh, but why is it time traveling then? It just felt maybe it didn't quite match up to what the expectations were. I don't know. It just felt weird. I do think there was a bit of a setup like, oh, you're going to time travel. It's going to be a real adventure show. And at the end of the day, it was like, it was truly a medical drama, like looking at research, trying to look at blood. How can we do that? You just happen to be in the 1870s. Right. So do you think that's what future episodes would be? Like they go back to the, I don't know, uh, uh, 1790s and it's a different disease. Was that, And it's just going to be like a medical drama every time? Maybe like Quantum Leap, but you're finding cures. But Quantum Leap at least had that every time he not only had to kind of figure out who he was, every episode was a different set of obstacles that he had to achieve so that time would stay the way it was. That really wasn't what this was. They had one little thing, but there wasn't, as we've mentioned, really any obstacles other than we just need to figure out the cure, which in the end they found by happenstance, really. Oh, for sure. I'm not saying this would be a more exciting show by like any stretch. What you're saying is you like this more than Quantum Leap. No, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Slander. <laughs> How dare you? Here's what I thought the regular version of the show is going to should should have been maybe or you know was going to be. I think every week they find out what weird standing set exists yeah. for something <laughs> yeah. in the past. They pick the closest disaster that happened to that time period and every every week was just some like weird travel to a set that is sta- an existing set that they could do a disaster right. film on no that's specters from the future yeah that's my new film or my new series specters i mean from you're the probably future. not wrong based on what the budget was and again we've said it actually looked pretty good i just think e- even the main characters you set them up we didn't really learn anything about them other than one's tired and one falls in love real quick I think my perfect version of the show is you keep the character who falls in love every time he goes back in time and is constantly having to leave a woman behind who's going to die that episode. I mean, that is kind of funny. Two, you bring that cigar chomping doctor with you. You've just got this like guy who doesn't know anything but 1870s medicine. He's useless to you, but he's always like forcing the patients to do things against their will. I think you're right. I think, yeah, if you, you keep the 1870s doctor, but I think what you have is he's got all these old timey things that seem like they're not going to work, but in the end he pulls it out. Like, t- taking out his teeth, that's not going to solve the problem. He's like, just watch me. And then and it's like, oh, yeah, removing his teeth with that wrench really did work. Yeah, and then the next episode, you're just, like, going to Pompeii 12 hours before yeah. everybody dies and just, like, wandering <laughs> exactly. around. Exactly. Oh, man, every time Dr. Henderson solves a problem with leeches, take a drink. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> every time he strangles someone, his solution for everything. <laughs> <laughs> He's constantly just, like, hitting yeah. his patients. <laughs> I thought that was going to be like Adams' role here, but he didn't really do a lot of successful action stuff. No, he had two runs and uh, two naps. Just abject failure the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's in my series, that's Adams. He's either asleep or they're waking him up to kill a man. <laughs> Are they going to have an episode where they try to cure his narcolepsy? <laughs> they, they go they go to the future to find a cure for narcolepsy, but it's just like, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, there's no cure powerful enough for him. Save that for the season finale. <laughs> not, not for Adam. They jump ahead to 2020 and buy him a Red Bull. <laughs> <laughs> it's like try this monster energy drink. That's funny. Um, all right, you guys. What do you want to rate time travelers? Nick, do you want to you want to kick us off? So I'm just gonna guess like a rating for a show that you can watch, but it's not real exciting. Let's give that a five out of ten. Five out of ten, eh? You know what? Obviously, it's a bit of a boring episode. It's not a big adventure episode. I don't know. It's an hour and 10 minutes long. I didn't have the worst time watching it. I definitely wouldn't want to watch more of it. But just like 
I, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick it up to a six point five because I like the disaster stuff. I like some of this stuff is just so weird and unusual. Definitely some boring moments, but I didn't think they lingered too badly. I'm gonna I'm gonna put a six point five. I think it's interesting as an oddity of things they were putting on TV in the 1970s in this sort of let's throw it at the wall and see what sticks. And I think we've mentioned it before. It seemed to be an interesting time where there was so many weird and uh, interesting shows. I think the concept is kind of cool and had some legs if it was done in a different direction. But I do think this was for an hour and 10. It was a pretty slow, boring movie where there could have been a lot more humor and a lot more adventure and a lot more uh, interesting characters and scenarios. So I'm going to go right down the middle as well and give it a five out of 10. Well, maybe not a glowing review. I think I, I think even I talking about it, enjoyed it more than I realized, but I'm going to stick with 6.5. That's fair. <laughs> All right. I mean, I guess that pretty much wraps it up for time travelers. Uh, Nick, thank you so much for joining us for a full episode this time. Yeah. Thanks again for having me. I hope it's, uh, it turned out a lot better than that five minute deleted scene before. <laughs> that's up to the that's up to the listeners to decide <laughs> and you know uh, i appreciate you getting into a boring medical drama <laughs> oh anytime a time traveling medical drama though any time traveling nice i'll be honest the more we describe the details of this show it is right up my alley <laughs> <laughs> yeah if only it were like a better show it's true uh time traveling <laughs> medical procedural <laughs> man oh man it but- could have been really good and it, like, it wasn't bad. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't great. <laughs> it could have been better. That was a 5 out of 10. But listener, if you have any thoughts on uh, Time Traveling Doctors, you can reach out to us at continuedrag at gmail.com. And we'll definitely have... There's some fun little clips from this show I think we'll have for Instagram and Twitter. The handle there is at continuumdrag. I'm not answering any, any emails from someone who has questions <laughs> about time traveling doctors. Delete. <laughs> <laughs> what if they are a time traveling doctor? <laughs> <laughs> then I have many questions, mostly about how effective is strangling. If you are a time traveling doctor, you better show up with an engraved watch that's very dear to me. Yeah, exactly. It, they've got an engraved watch with a message from Nick's wife on it about the uh, homebrew <laughs> he has in his garage to secure COVID. <laughs> well, that doctor gets a drink. <laughs> All right, uh, that about wraps it us for uh, blah, 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 blah. that about wraps it up for us, listener. And uh, Jordan, see you next week. See you then. Continuum Drag is recorded in Toronto, Ontario. Theme music by James Rex Seedler, produced by Jordan Dulloch and Luke Black. Special thanks to Aaron Hughes.